makes covenant relationships. God wants his creation, his created beings participating in his purpose. And that participation always leads to him in ways partially or wholly fulfilling his promises. Uh, so these records are totally awesome going through Genesis. Uh, we're going to come back to the Hebrew writings later on in order to uh, illustrate it through the Mosaic Covenant, which is essential in understanding uh, in order to get a larger grip on that. But we are children of promise. Uh, Abraham was a awesome man. He trust he did trust God. There's no doubt about it. He's called the father of faith. He's faithful Abraham. He's our example biblically of ha just how awesome trust in God can be, uh, and how pro how provisional our God is in. Uh, keeping his promise of uh, the promise in Genesis 20 as we see it ration out with Abimelech Abraham has not brought forth the promise seed yet uh, he's back in another situation to where he pawns his wife off as his sister and the same results and you know what God fulfilled it the same way it's two different records and two different accounts <coughs> uh, in verse 21, it says, The thing was very grievous, was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And this word and the thing, the promise was very grievous. Now, this is God some 74 years or 24 years later uh, explaining to Abraham that what he did with the maid was not what God promised that the the promised child the child that was going to be the first in a line of descendants to abraham was going to come out of him and sarah and it abraham, it hurt abraham's feeling this promise hurt him because he loved ishmael ishmael was his son he loved ishmael and god works with abraham on it it's really so cool because God still works with Abraham. He, he blesses Ishmael in a way that would bless Abraham. Uh, in verse 21, 26, is, we're back to Abimelech. I want not that thou hast done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither did yet I hear of it, but this day he's defending himself because he found out that uh, Sarah was Abraham's wife. And Abraham took a sheep and an oxen and he gave them to Abimelech, the both of them made a covenant with each other. Because Abimelech was afraid of God and his retribution against him because of what he did to God's prophet Abraham. So Abraham is working, he's he's doing what he's learning. He's he's God is teaching him about promise and covenant, and he is in turn making a covenant with Abimelech. Now, uh, Abimelech actually uh, gets pretty hairy later on because uh, remember earlier we found out that the uh, the, pro the, 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 the sin of the Amorites, uh, well, guess who Abimelech was king of? <laughs> the Amorites had not fully manifested itself, it had not fully come into fruition uh, at this time. And God was waiting for that before he made a move with Israel, which was not going to happen for 400 years. Uh, he was, that's how far ahead he was in the chess game. Mm -hmm. I mean, just amazing. He does not have absolute foreknowledge. He knows everything knowable. And therefore, he plays the game a lot better I think John uses Ricky Fisher as an example uh, in the uh, One Day with the Creator class, and rightfully so. 
He plays the game very well. But Abraham makes a covenant with Abimelech to show that he's, hey, he's not going to, just like he's going to praise. And Abimelech gets healed the same way Pharaoh got healed. And it came to pass after these, after promises. <laughs> Verse 22 of Genesis. And, and again, I'm going through this to illustrate promises and covenant. There's a whole story here. This is God has made the promise to Abraham. The son has been born. The uh, took 25 years for that for God to show Abraham just how awesome he is in fulfilling his promise by giving him and Sarah his son Isaac. And you get to you get to Genesis 22, 1. It came to pass after the promise that Elohim tempted Abraham. Now, I have a whole other teaching on this idea of Elohim uh, tempting Abraham after the Debar, after the promise, because the son has been born. The promise to that extent has been fulfilled. And all of a sudden, Abraham gets tempted. Uh, but that is for another day and another dollar. And said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. <coughs> uh, his relationship was <coughs> developing strongly from a spiritual perspective. Genesis twenty two sixteen, And said, By myself I have sworn, says Yahweh, for because thou hast done, done according to this promise, now, if we read in Hebrews, we find out that Abraham uh, Abraham reasoned within himself that God was even able to raise the dead. So he didn't have a real problem with this sacrificial idea of Isaac because he believed God was going to get him up from the dead. He even told his servants, hey, me and the boy are going to go up and worship and we'll be back. And he had planned on killing the boy because of the revelation he got in 22.1. He was so confident. So no matter who gave him this temptation, which God it was, the fact that he acted on it because of his trust in God. So whether it was, I don't believe it was actually Yahweh, because it was Yahweh that provided the lamb. Uh, Elohim is a very broad word in the Hebrew writings. The B'nai Elohim are sons of God. So whatever Elohim this was that tempted Abraham and said, sacrifice the kid that, that Yahweh just promised was going to be where his descendants came out of and where the ultimate promise would be. Abraham did it because he trusted God was even able to raise the dead. He understood resurrection. He understood promise. And he understood hope. That's why God was able to take him. We get tripped. Believers don't have to be afraid of getting tricked. They have to be. They have to be afraid of not trusting God, because <laughs> you want to fear something. You want to have the fear of the Lord. Fear not being with Him, because everything away from Him sucks. Uh, verse twenty-two. It says, Yahweh, because Thou hast done according to the promise, Thou hast not withhold those son. You think God had a personal looking forward to what he, his relationship would be to Jesus Christ. And not only that, but using this as an example of his relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. You think his heart didn't just melt at what Abraham was doing here, willing to sacrifice his own son? And, and verse 20, and it came to pass after these things that after the promise <laughs> that it was told to Abraham, saying, Behold, Malak, uh, has also borne children to thy uh, brother Nabor. And this is uh, actually God setting up uh, Abraham's descendant Isaac to be wed and to keep it within the bloodstream. This terminology and this idea of promise versus covenant, after it's explained, I mean, Noah, it was definitely explained in Noah, even there was an endemic covenant to it. Adam had free reign. I provided all of this for you. Just stay away from that tree. <laughs> he didn't do too good. Noah, there was a covenantal relationship on how things were going to be after the flood. Abraham, there was a promise made and a covenantal relationship. 
And during each one of these, we see a progressive understanding of just what these terms mean. By the time we get to the Christian writings in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, uh, we start reading the account Paul's giving concerning this. Uh, what Abraham, uh, what did Abraham warrant, what, what did he do to deserve what we're about to read? That's what I want you to think about here. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, So also Abraham, this is the verb, pistois, acted, believe, acted on God's promise. And it was credited to him for righteousness. Well, what action did he take? Uh, verse 7. Uh, understand then that those who have trust, faith, the noun form, those who have trust are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by trust and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, the good news. By uh, what did God tell Abraham that we just read? All the nations will be blessed through you. Wasn't that one of the promises? And Abraham trusted God's promise. All the nations will be blessed because of you. Now, has that promise been fulfilled yet? No, it's not fulfilled in us. It's, it's exemplified in us to the point of, but it will be fulfilled in the future when Israel reigns over all the nations of the world. When a new covenant is made because they broke the old one. But God made it by promise. He made his covenant with Abraham unconditional. Doesn't matter what you do. I'm going to still do this. God's redemptive plan was not tied up in the abilities or the works of any man except Jesus Christ. The, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by trust and announced the gospel, that good news, in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. There's no secret, that's no secret that was going to happen. So those who rely on trust are blessed along with Abraham the man of trust. This principle is universal. It's a universal. Was Abraham a Jew? No. Well, no, absolutely not. He wasn't. He was a Gentile. The Jewish nation hasn't been brought up yet. God is calling out his nation through Israel to bless the nations. And they were supposed to do that by keeping the word and keeping God's faithfulness and keeping the covenant. They were very wishy-washy with that, uh, but it didn't stop God because he knew that in his son, that Jesus Christ would fulfill that covenantial relationship with a new and everlasting covenant. Uh, in verse 10, it says, For all who rely on the works of the law, now that's a covenant, are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in everything written in the book of the law. That's their part in fulfilling their contract. Uh, works by the law is what you earn. Trusting God is holding him to the promises. <laughs> just like Abraham, just like faithful Abraham. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Because the righteous will live by trust. God always intended it to be that way. And it was that way even throughout the uh, schoolmaster of the covenantial relationships before Christ. The person who does these things will live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from that covenantial relationship, from the curse of the law. Why is it cursed? Because it reminded you of your sins. Nobody could live up to that standard. What, that the law was bad? Or the covenant was bad? Or the, the, the rules weren't bad? None of that stuff was bad. It was all good. But nobody could live up to it. Nobody. So Christ redeemed us from that curse of being reminded daily of our sins. By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. 
He redeemed us in order that the blessings, now here you're starting to get some distinction between the Hebrew prophecies of Israel and the nations and us. He redeemed us, Christ, this is, this is the promised seed and his seed, us. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by trust we might receive the covenant of the Spirit, right? I'm waiting for everybody to scream. It doesn't <laughs> say the covenant of the Spirit, does it? It doesn't say that. It says, by trust we, now, not, not, the, Gentile, not the nations that Abraham blessed, not Israel, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. The whole point uh, is that salvation does not come by any law. Uh, it doesn't come by your works. It comes by what God accomplished in his only son, Jesus Christ. And when we come back next week, we're going to go into, or the week after, or the next session, I guess I should say. We're going to go into this uh, revelation that Paul writes about in uh, to the, the, in the letter, uh, Galatians, in the letter to the Galatians, excuse me. And we're going to go and do some very strong comparisons between that and then pick up the letter and the promises and the covenant that was mosaic in its relationship. Um, and we'll uh, finally start to bring it together in Ephesians. So that's what I got for tonight, guys. I know a lot of very dry part of the segments. I tried to make it live as much as I could, but I really feel that we got to get these scriptures out in front of our faces. Mm -hmm before we actually go into the Christian writings and look at this from a, a, a scope perspective, so to speak. That's all I got for that, Mr. Don. Well, thank well, you very much. Let's all say good night. Although we're not going to place. Good night. Good night. And we'll see you in the green room, which is right where we are. So we'll see you there.